Hello everyone and welcome to our live stream event, Breast Reconstruction, Your Reconstruction Questions Answered. My name is Ed Bottomley with the Department of Communication. Today, October the 21st, is actually BRA Day, B-R-A, standing for Breast Reconstruction Awareness. BRA Day is celebrated every year by the National Plastic Surgery Foundation and the American Society of Plastic Surgeons to educate women about the different options available and empower them to make the best decision for their particular situation. I'm joined today by two of our Michigan Medicine Plastic Surgeons, Dr. Jessica Sue and Dr. Paige Myers. Dr. Sue and Dr. Myers both specialize in reconstruction. They'll lead our conversation, but we'll also hear from other faculty members via video and also from several patients sharing their personal experiences. Before we begin, I want to mention that my colleagues are monitoring the comments on the chat to look for questions and we'll try to ask some of those later in the discussion. If someone would prefer to ask a question by email, that's also possible. They should write to ask-mishmed at med .umich.edu. One more time with that email address, that's ask-mishmed at med.umich.edu. We'll be monitoring that inbox throughout the chat. The chat itself will last about 45 minutes to an hour and a recording will be available afterward. We're also planning a follow-up story on our health blog site, which we'll link to from the Michigan Medicine social media channels next week. Dr. Sue, Dr. Myers, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm happy you, to be here. We're, we're really excited to be here too. Yeah, it's great to have both of you on here. And with that, um, I'd like to uh, start with a video of Dr. Momo, one of the plastic surgeons at Michigan Medicine. Um, and that person, uh, will be uh, introducing breast reconstruction at Michigan Medicine. If, if Dr. Sue, if you could give an intro, I don't know if I gave that intro for you. <laughs> uh, you did, but that's okay. So Dr. Momo is one of our plastic surgeons here at Mi Michigan Medicine. Um, and he uh, has a video to just discuss the general topic of breast reconstruction. So we'll start with that uh, to kick off this live Facebook event. I think in uh, our present day, um, breast reconstruction is in a good place because uh, when patients come in with breast cancer, need mastectomies and need to be reconstructed, we have multiple options we can offer. Um, I like to tell patients that we try to tailor the reconstruction option to their personal needs and their personal preferences. So I talk with them about a host of options. Um, I don't limit it to one or two techniques. I tell them about things ranging from implant-based reconstruction to using um, all sorts of tissue from different parts of the body or combinations of things depending on what they need. In looking for a reconstructive surgeon, I think it's important that patients select a person who is able to perform all procedures that are available today. Um, at times, patients will see a surgeon for a consultation and they get offered one option, as in this is the only thing that can be done um, for you and the next patient who comes in gets the same uh, option. I think I don't think that's fair to patients and I think patients should have all options available and then uh, based on their personal history and other factors, um, the correct operation can be tailored to them. Consulting with patients about reconstruction, I, we ultimately go into detail to talk about um, what they can expect even before they get to the operating room, how, what's going to happen while they're in the operating room, and what to expect in the post-operative period. Uh, patients are worried about um, what they're going to feel when they wake up after an operation, what kind of scars they're going to have, how long is it going to um, take for them to get back on their feet and get back to life as usual. Reconstruction here at the University of Michigan um, requires a team and we approach it in that fashion. I work with uh, a group of uh, uh, breast surgeons, oncologists, 
and nurses who see a lot of patients dealing with breast cancer. And in doing these complex uh, microsurgical reconstructive procedures, I think it is necessary to have uh, the team around you in order to achieve the kind of success that is necessary. So that was our video with Dr. Momo. And before we move on to our next one, Dr. Myers, I wanted to uh, push to you and ask you a little bit about Bra Day. Sure. Um, as you mentioned, Bra Day stands for Breast Reconstruction Awareness Day, and it was actually first held in 2012 under the leadership of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons and now partnering with the Plastic Surgery Foundation. Now encompasses over 30 countries. Breast Reconstruction Awareness Day advocates for the rights of patients to be made aware of their options at the time of diagnosis and be provided access to a plastic surgeon to further discuss those options. If you've seen the logo for Breast Reconstruction Awareness Day, it's a pink ribbon with a closed loop at the bottom to symbolize closing the loop on breast cancer since re reconstruction comes after a woman has been diagnosed and successfully treated. This day today that we're celebrating will recognize the many faces of breast cancer and the unique journey that each patient endures. Many women feel are distraught by the news that they have breast cancer and feel alone. This special day will ensure that they are not alone. Our role as plastic surgeons is to make sure that the patient knows all of her reconstructive options before her cancer is treated and removed to give her the best options for fulfilling a life beyond breast cancer. The bravery of each woman diagnosed with breast cancer will be strongly acknowledged today and every day. Although women have different journeys, they'll never feel alone learning their breast reconstruction options. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Myers. That was, in, that was incredibly powerful and a, a really important explanation. I think it's fantastic that us three are able to convene on today of, of all days. Um, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, next up, we are going to watch a video on implant reconstruction with Dr. Theodore Kung. Hello there, my name is Theodore Kung and I'm one of the plastic surgeons at Michigan Medicine. And I'm very excited to be part of Breast Reconstruction Awareness Day. Breast reconstruction is actually a very big part of my practice. And today I'm here to introduce to you one of the most common options for breast reconstruction, which is implant-based reconstruction. There are many advantages of implant-based breast reconstruction, and these include the fact that implant-based reconstruction can often be uh, uh, shorter in duration, uh, particularly when you compare these operations to autologous reconstruction options. Uh, another advantage is that there's no additional donor site, meaning that the surgical site is limited to the chest. If you're considering implant-based breast reconstruction, there are several important issues to talk about with your plastic surgeon. For example, often a tissue expander can be placed first to expand the breast envelope, and this may actually allow a patient to increase the size of the reconstructed breast. Other issues such as the placement of the implant above the pec muscle or below the pec muscle, or the use of a silicone implant versus a saline implant are very critical to the decision-making process. If you are considering breast reconstruction, I encourage you to reach out to a board-certified plastic surgeon to have a full discussion of all of your options, including implant-based reconstruction. Thank you so much for watching out. That was our uh, implant reconstruction video. And at this point, I'd like to push to, to both you, Dr. Sue and Dr. Myers, what are the typical questions that you guys see uh, with regards to implant reconstruction? Uh, one question that women often have is how often do my implants, if I get them, um, how often do my implants need to be changed? And I think that the, you know, a long time ago, there was a, there was a thing about changing your implants every 10 years or every five years. And with our current, um, our current implants, there's actually no timeline for changing them. We only recommend changing them if there's a if there's a problem such as rupture or causing any other issues. Um, another question a lot of people have, especially those of us who lived through the 80s and 90s, are whether or not silicone implants are safe. Um, I would say that the silicone implants that we use now are extremely safe. Uh, the FDA does recommend that after an implant is placed um, for either augmentation or for reconstruction that uh, a MRI is performed three years after placement to evaluate for rupture and then every five years after that. 
Thank you. A anything to add, Dr. Myers? Oh, looks like you might yeah. be muted. I think those are really the most um, common things that, that I've seen. Um, and you know, um, a little bit later, we'll talk about reconstruction using your own tissue. Um, and the nice thing is that even though you get implants at one time, um, you always have that option of using your own tissue a little bit later. So that's a, that is a question I often get asked in clinic and want women to know that, that they do have options um, if they choose one type um, and then decide to change. Thank you both for, for those, uh, for that feedback there. And we are now going to move on uh, to our next video and we'll see everybody back after we watch that. Hi, I'm really excited to be participating in Breast Reconstruction Awareness Day here at the University of Michigan. I'm Jeff Koslin, and I'm one of the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgeons. One of the best parts about breast reconstruction is that there are so many options available to women who choose to undergo these procedures. One of the procedures that we specialize in here is called a deep flap or a DIEP flap. In this operation, we take the skin and fat from the lower abdomen and transplant it up to the chest to make a nice, soft and natural feeling breast. Unlike the traditional procedure called a TRAM or a T-R-A-M, the deep flap uses microsurgical techniques to transfer the skin and fat without harvesting any of the muscle from the abdomen. That tissue is then transplanted up to the chest where the artery and vein are sewn into new blood vessels in the chest to reestablish circulation to allow the tissue to survive. While this is a bigger operation than some of the other reconstructive options, it also gives the best long-term durable results as well as the most natural look and feel. Hopefully, when you're talking to your surgeon, this is one of the options that they'll uh, potentially discuss with you. So that was our autologous reconstruction video. We're now gonna move on to a patient video discussing autologous breast reconstruction. And we'll move on to that right now. Hi, my name is Erin. One year and three months ago, Dr. Kung performed the deep flap surgery on me uh, because I have a gene called CHECK2, which puts me at a higher risk for breast cancer. This procedure um, was intense. Um, I chose it though because it meant I didn't need implants and I really liked the idea of using my own tissue for the reconstruction. Um, the procedure uh, was very long and um, the recovery time was long as well. Uh, but again, I would do it again. Um, it was such a relief and, it, and it's still such a relief to know that I don't have to worry about breast cancer anymore. Um, I've had too many friends and too many family members who've had to go through that disease. And um, at least I can take this one off the list. So, uh, I'm happy about that. Again, I like the idea of not having to have implants. Uh, I didn't know that I was a candidate at first for that procedure. Uh, I thought I was gonna have to um, do reconstruction with implants um, until I met Dr. Kong and he told me that we could do this with uh, what was then my, my belly. Um, so it was pretty tight when I woke up uh, it was hard to stand up straight um, for probably two weeks. Uh, and then after that two to three week mark, that's when things really started to turn around for me as far as being able to move much more freely. Um, if you choose this surgery, uh, I think that what helped me the most was a really strong support system um, I lucked out. My mother is a nurse and she is a rock star. I have sisters and friends who all came to help because you go home with drains. Um, you go home with significant incisions that need to be kept an eye on. And um, you need help remembering to take medicine. And if you have younger children at all, uh, you're going to need help with them. Um, again, the right decision for me um, everybody is different, uh, but I really do appreciate Dr. Kung and his team for what they do and how they help me and, um, very possibly could have saved my life. So, um, again, uh, I can't speak highly enough of U of M and 
their level of care and expertise. Um, for me, just the peace of mind, um, knowing that I don't have to worry about that is, is so huge. And uh, again, a, a lucky one as well that I didn't have the disease and then have to make that choice. I had time. It took me a good three years from being told that I have that gene to an actual surgery date. And some people don't have that option. So I'm very grateful and uh, very happy again um, with how things turned out, even though that first month was pretty rough. Um, I'm on the other side of it now and um, again, very happy. So thank you very much, Dr. Kung. So that was our patient video discussing autologous breast reconstruction. I'd now like to move to you, Dr. Myers, and ask you some of the typical questions that come up with relation to this. Sure. Um, uh, here at the University of Michigan, I um, specialize in using um, women's own tissue to recreate the breast mound after a mastectomy. Um, and I think there's been a lot of um, unknowns about this kind of technology and how it works. And so, you know, in speaking with patients, um, I try to explain to them that um, although it's a little bit um, more work upfront, both for us and the patient, um, the, out, the long term outcomes um, tend to be a little bit more durable that require fewer revisions down the road. Um, so generally, these surgeries tend to be a little bit longer. Um, there's initially a slight higher complication rate. Um, but like I said, this is a nice um, adjunct that we have to use as the tissue nat ages naturally with um, the women and have a, a lower uh, revision rate um, as time goes on. Um, we, uh, as technology is really advanced in the field of reconstruction, um, these free flaps, as they're called, that used to be uh, quite challenging. Um, they've been made a lot easier with technical refinements. Um, and increasing imaging modalities um, before the surgery. So for instance, um, I would recommend my patients to get a, a CAT scan before their um, procedure, just to kind of act as a roadmap for uh, us while we're working to know exactly um, where the blood vessels are um, that we need for our tissue reconstruction. Um, as Dr. Coslow pointed out um, in his video, um, usually the most common site for using your own tissue is um, your abdomen. Um, although, um, as time has gone on, we've really developed um, other uh, donor site options, um, which include um, the back, the buttock region, and the outer and the inner thigh. Um, so I think now we will be discussing another video um, with some wonderful patients who have used their uh, thigh tissue for breast reconstruction. Thank you, Dr. Myers, and let's, let's look at that video. Hi, my name is Tiffany Dietz, and I had the tug surgery about a year and a half ago with Dr. Kung. And I'm Tegan Higgins, Tiffany's identical twin sister, and I too had the tug procedure with Dr. Kung. Mine was about nine months ago. When I got the diagnosis that I had invasive breast cancer, I was really scared, terrified actually. Um, I had gone to U of M because I knew that that's where I wanted to be treated. And I, their surgical oncologist told me um, that a mastectomy was an option. Um, it was one that I had always considered if I ever had breast cancer. I had some friends that had um, mastectomies that um, they did the um, implants. And so I'd spoken to them about um, the different um, the different situations that they had gone through, um, multiple surgeries, and um, it really sounded terrifying to me. But when I went to see Dr. Kung, he really um, showed me all the options that there were, and the natural tissue replacement seemed like the right choice for me. Um, at the time, there was some breast cancer associated with a type of implant, and that was really concerning to me to fight one breast cancer and then 10 years down the road, um, develop another type of cancer. Um, so the breast, um, natural breast tissue seemed like a really good option. Um, there wasn't enough um, fat in my abdomen to perform that kind of surgery um, that they normally do. I believe that's the DIEP flap. Um, but Dr. Kung explained to me that, that he thought there was enough tissue in my thigh that they could take it from there. 
um, which is what we ended up doing. And um, I couldn't be happier with the results. Um, Dr. Kung did, and his team did a fabulous job. I'm really happy that I went to U of M and I'm really happy that I met Dr. Kung. Um, so when she was diagnosed with invasive breast cancer, they there were some spots on the mammogram that they were watching for me. So I decided to go get those biopsied and they came back with lobular carcinoma in situ. So the different doctors I talked to thought that it would be a good idea for me to go ahead and get a mastectomy as well because of my identical twin sister's um, history. Uh, so I did that and I knew my sister had gone to U of M. So I also went there. I knew she dealt with Dr. Kong and she was very happy with his results. And I was too, because I saw them. And so I too went down the path of natural tissue reconstruction. Um, I did it for several reasons. One, my identical twin sister had done it and they, it was an amazing job. And also because the um, natural tissue appealed to me just because they, they felt, they feel um, a lot more natural. And also it wasn't something that 10 years down the line I was going to have to do another surgery to replace an implant. Um, so I decided to do this particular surgery. I also didn't have um, as much tissue in my abdomen. So they used tissue from the inner thigh to reconstruct the breast. Um, they were able to go a little bit bigger than my normal. Um, and I was very, very happy with the results. I looked on the internet several times um, just to see before and after pictures of the different surgeries and was not too thrilled with the outcomes, but I knew it was ultimately a decision that I'd have to make. Um, however, I can tell you that Dr. Kong and the team at U of M did an amazing job and my breasts looked better than they did prior to the surgery. So I was really, really happy um, with the outcome. Um, it was a difficult surgery. It was probably more upfront um, in terms of recovery than would be a um, implant, but um, the results speak for themselves. I'm really, really happy with the results. I'm happy that I don't have to do any more mammograms. I don't have to worry about that every three to six months. <laughs> um, so, so all in all, I'm thrilled with the uh, decision that I made um, for myself. Um, if you're thinking about this type of surgery, um, some things I can tell you. Um, going into it, I really I did I did yoga before, but I really amped up my yoga, and I really feel like that helped me with strength and conditioning. I would say one thing is after surgery, get up and get moving. Don't move a lot. Um, don't move for long periods of time, but do get up and moving. I really think it helps, and um, I think the nurses were surprised at, at how. Um, able I was to get up and move around. And I think that's really important. Um, it will be about a month before you kind of feel back to nor like your normal self. Um, it's really tight in certain areas. Um, but I would say that it's, it's well worth it having to go through one surgery. Um, it is a scary process, but it is one um, where the other side is, is um, really great. Yeah. I would agree, um, all of those things. It was a, a difficult recovery, um, but it didn't last forever. And um, she and I are proof that you can get through it and you can do it and you can come out on the other side um, happy and healthy. And um, it was just a, a wonderful decision for me. Welcome back. Thank you for watching that video. I'm now gonna pass over to you, Dr. Sue, for some comments. Yeah, so uh, this is a, a small introduction to research at, regarding breast reconstruction at Michigan Medicine. Um, breast reconstruction has been a very, very active part of research, not just um, at the national level, but also at our institution. Uh, there are many facets of uh, research are arenas, including patient reported outcomes and um, also the effects of radiation on breast reconstruction and the effects of uh, reconstruction on patient well-being. And so uh, here's Dr. Wilkins to talk a little bit about, uh, about breast reconstruction research here at Michigan Medicine. So as a member of the breast reconstruction team at the University of Michigan, one of my focuses has been on looking at long-term patient reported outcomes of breast reconstruction. Our team has been doing this for over 25 years, 
And essentially what we've been interested in looking at was the long-term impact of breast reconstruction on patients' daily lives. We've actually been able to demonstrate significant benefits in well-being, quality of life, and social functioning among patients who choose reconstruction. Uh, we've not only uh, spread these results amongst the professional community via journals and professional presentations, our big focus now is in finding ways to get this information to women who are making important decisions about breast reconstruction. Uh, to help do that, we've developed an interactive website called BRIDA, B-R-I-D-A, which in the coming weeks will be put uh, on the internet uh, to help patients make decisions giving them current, up-to-date, uh, relevant information on reconstruction and uh, the impact uh, of these operations on uh, the outcomes that patients see and feel in their daily lives. Uh, this will empower patients with information to work with their surgeons to make the best choices for each individual woman. And we're very excited about this. Welcome back. Thank you for watching that video. I'm now also going to uh, pass over to Dr. Sue again for a few more comments. Uh, so one of the things that is unique about getting your breast cancer care here at the University of Michigan uh, is the multidisciplinary nature of the way that we treat uh, breast cancer and breast cancer patients. Uh, the mo patients that go through our breast cancer care clinic uh, are treated in a team fashion and the team, the team includes surgical oncology, plastic surgery, medical oncology, radiation oncology, the radiologists, pathologists, social work, clinical nurses, and also care coordinators. And it's a very, very powerful uh, thing to be able to get comprehensive care all in one place. Thank you so much. Um, you know, we're gonna move on to the live Q&A section right now. And we have, we have some questions for you to answer. Before we do that, I'd like to note that right now we're live, uh, but obviously this video is gonna be recorded. So if you do watch this video and you have a pressing qu question, don't hesitate to put that in the comments section. We monitor all our social media and we'll, we'll endeavor to make sure that we get answers for you, even if you're watching a recorded version of this. So let's move on to the live Q&A. The first question that I have up what if I don't want reconstruction? Uh, so uh, there are many patients who choose to just go the mastectomy route, get their cancer taken care of, and do not want to pursue any additional um, breast rec formal breast reconstruction with either implants or their own tissue. Um, there have been a lot of things written about these patients. They call themselves the flat and the fabulous. Um, and uh, our breast surgeons here at the University of Michigan do a fantastic job making it what we call an aesthetic flat. Uh, and uh, most patients do not need any additional surgery after that. Depending on body type, there may be additional skin or sometimes there are some changes after radiation uh, that can change the aesthetic of the, of the mastectomy site. And if that does happen, we do see patients to help with contouring and to, to make uh, the flat and the fabulous a little bit more fabulous. Thank you for that. Anything to add, Dr. Myers? No, um, I think that's really great. And you know, the this option, um, you know, I tell my patients too, the first option is is no reconstruction at all. And though the studies show and women report um, incredible benefits to being reconstruction, ultimately we um, tailor our care to the patient's wishes and uh, needs. Um, so uh, if that's what they desire, then then we're here for them in any capacity. That's, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you, uh, both of you, for your input on that. The, the next question that I have up here, I'm still debating on reconstruction reconstruction from a sizable lumpectomy. Would using my tissue work for reconstructing a non-mastectomy? Um, this is a really fantastic question and something that we um, work with we work with all the time. Um, we have uh, a ton of tricks up our sleeve to balance out the, the size of the breasts following um, a partial mastectomy or what's um, often called breast conservation therapy. Um, in early stage cancers, um, some women are candidates for a partial mastectomy and then sometimes go on for radiation therapy. Um, so from our standpoint, our uh, role in this patient's care is to make um, the breasts look the same. 
um, in some women that involves um, doing rearranging some of the tissue that's been operated on on the cancer side, and then doing what's called a balancing reduction or mastopexy, where we remove some of the breast tissue on the other side and do a small lift procedure so they're even. Um, in women with smaller breasts, if there's a sizable defect after a lumpectomy, we do have options for restoring that tissue um, on the cancer side with uh, some of their own tissue. Sometimes if the defect is small enough, this involves what's called fat grafting. And that's essentially where we use liposuction um, and remove fat from sometimes the abdomen or thighs or hips or wherever there's a little extra um, and inject that to uh, fill the cavity that's been created from the lumpectomy. Um, if it's a little bit bigger um, and requires some more skin or a uh, more sizable tissue, we do have options um, for rotating tissue from the back over to fill that defect. Or in um, some cases, we do perform free flaps, uh, you know, using your belly or using your thighs um, for these um, partial mastectomy defects. Um, so, uh, like I said, this is um, sometimes referred to as oncoplastic. Um, surgery as it kind of involves the cancer surgeon from the oncology standpoint, us as plastic surgeons. Um, but working together, we uh, recreate the breast um, after a lumpectomy to make it look like the other side, or like I said, um, work on the other side to make it look like the side that's been treated already. So we do have uh, a lot of options out there for women that, that need it. Thank you for that. Anything to add, Dr. Sue? No, I think Dr. Myers covered all of it. Uh, fat grafting is a very powerful way of adding volume to the breast, especially after breast reconstruction. And we do use it in all facets of breast reconstruction as an adjunct after either implant or autologous reconstruction. Thank you for that. The next question that we have up, um, what if I change my mind and want reconstruction later? So, so that's a great question. Um, I tell all my patients that breast reconstruction, there's no timeline for breast reconstruction. And many patients with, after getting a new diagnosis of breast cancer, all they want is to have their cancer out and as soon as possible. And so those patients can undergo mastectomy and they're not thinking about reconstruction at the time, um, but at any, at, at any time, months to years to decades later, all the options for breast reconstruction are still there, both implant-based and autologous reconstruction our options in a delayed fashion. Thank you for that. Anything to add from your side, Dr. Mines? Yeah, sure. Um, I completely agree with Dr. Sue with that. Um, the, it, it's just so um, sometimes overwhelming for women to hear this diagnosis and have to go through their cancer treatment. Um, and we like to provide them with all the options at the time of their diagnosis, but it, it is certainly a lot of information. Um, so we always emphasize that we're here at any time for them um, for whatever they need. Um, the, and I previously mentioned that, uh, you know, one of the drawbacks perhaps from using your own tissue is the time of recovery. Um, it takes a lot, you know, in the order of, of months to, to really come back to your normal self. So um, if some women just want uh, implants, it's a little bit shorter recovery. I tell them that that's totally reasonable. Um, we can do tissue expansion and some implants. Um, and then, you know, in a time in their life when it's a little bit better or, or they're, you know, um, now motivated for using their own tissue that we, that we still have, we absolutely still have that option. Thank you both for, for your answers on that. The next question that I have up reads, what happens if I can't keep my nipple? Uh, so uh, if you're not able to keep your nipple at the time of mastectomy, we can reconstruct one um, or they can be tattooed. So if you undergo nipple aerial or reconstruction, uh, we can use the skin up on your mastectomy flap or if you get autologous reconstruction and have skin from your free flap, um, we can use the skin off of there to make a projecting papule as part of the nipple. And then uh, you can then undergo tattooing to create the pigment uh, of the nipple to match the other side. Um, some women do not want to have any projecting part of their nipple areolar reconstruction. And so these patients oftentimes will pursue what's called three-dimensional tattooing. And there are some, some places in the area that do this where they, the, by using uh, different shading uh, for the tattoo, it can look like there's three-dimensional structure to the nipple, uh, but actually no production. Thank you for that. Dr. Mines, anything to add there? Yeah, um, I just want to emphasize how um, great that the, um, the tattooing that we do in the office really, really looks. Um, women are overwhelmingly pleased with this decision. Um, from a timeline standpoint, um, generally these 
this the nipple areola complex reconstruction happens about three or so months after your final reconstruction. Um, and it can be done uh, in the office. Although it also can be done if you need any revisions to your implant or using your own tissue surgery. Um, sometimes we can combine those revisions with the um, uh, nipple areola complex reconstruction as well. Thank you for that. Um, the next question that we have up, how long after completing radiation should you wait to do breast reconstruction? Um, that's, that's a great question. And unfortunately, there's um, a lot of varying um, reports on, on the best way to do this. Um, typically, um, implant-based reconstruction is not ideal in the setting of radiation therapy. The radiation just causes some um, soft tissue changes that really work better if you use your own tissue. Um, there's a slightly higher uh, implant failure rate in radiated tissue. So we often will work with women to kind of make a, a better plan for using your own tissue. Um, and like I said, that's a little bit patient dependent and a little bit surgeon dependent. Um, also considering your cancer details too. Um, one type of reconstruction that um, is, is common is uh, kind of confusingly called delayed immediate, where at the time of the mastectomy, um, patients who are planned to have radiation will get tissue expanders placed. And we will explain them to the size that they like, and then we allow them to wait, complete the radiation therapy, um, and then one year later go back for the, uh, using their own tissue. Um, that has advantages and disadvantages as well. Um, some um, studies and surgeons advocate for um, not putting any tissue expanders in, um, doing the radiation, then waiting, you know, six months to one year before using your own tissue. Um, and there are some reports and surgeons that advocate for doing using your own tissue at the time of the mastectomy and then radiating that flap. Um, so that's just a question that um, would best kind of be discussed with your um, individual surgeon and given your um, uh, you know your clinical details and then you know your surgeon's thoughts too. Thank you for that. I, I see you nodding, Dr. Sue. Anything to add from your end? Uh, sure. So. Uh, patients who want to have implant-based breast reconstruction and are going to require um, radiation, we counsel them that the, the complication rate is higher, whether you have radiation with the implant reconstruction first or you get radiation first and then your implant re reconstruction. Uh, the way that we try and mitigate those that complication rate is often to combine the use of your own tissue with implant reconstruction. And typically that's done by using skin and muscle from your back, which can be brought into the, to your chest to help with the expansion of the skin and to support the implant. Thank you for that. Um, the next question that we have up, we wanna refer back to the video that we all saw with the identical twins. They mentioned a secondary cancer. Can you speak more about that? Sure. Um, so the secondary cancer that um, those women were referring to is known as um, BIAALCL um, or breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Um, this has been kind of more popularized over the past you know, 10 or 15 years. Um, it's a very rare form of lymphoma um, that develops occasionally around um, implants, um, often used for reconstruction or augmentation. Um, the thought is that it's possibly related to chronic inflammation um, and importantly has only been described in uh, textured implants. Um, so as mentioned, you know, the, the options for um, implant-based reconstruction are smooth or textured. And so this, this rare and um, not very serious type of lymphoma um, is only been described in, in uh, textured implants. Um, the average time to really diagnosis is about 10 years. Um, and a, uh, one of the more recent studies um, coming out says that there is a, about an incidence of one in every 1,000 textured implants, which is a little bit higher than previously reported. Um, however, the important thing to know that is that once this is diagnosed, it's um, almost, it's very often curable. Um, the, um, the implant and the capsule or the scar tissue that forms around the implant is removed. And most women go on to do, you know, to do very, very well for this. Thank you. Dr. Sue, I saw you nodding again. Is there anything to add from your end? 
Um, just that here at Michigan, we only use smooth implants. We have not used uh, textured implants uh, in, in the recent past. So um, if there's any question or if you don't remember whether or not you had textured or smooth implants, the best thing to do is to, ch uh, to check with your plastic surgeon and also to let us know if you have any concerns regarding your implant type. Wonderful. Thank you. It looks like we've got through all our questions, but I always ask one more question, which is, do you think there's anything we've missed? I know this has been a very expansive uh, live stream. We've gone into a lot of areas, but do you, do you feel like there are any topics that we might have missed? Um, no, I, th I think this has been pretty inclusive. Um, thanks so much for, for, for hosting us today. Um, I just really want to uh, reiterate that um, I know um, myself and Dr. Sue and everyone here at Michigan Medicine um, really wants, uh, really feel strongly about uh, patient-centered care. So we will, um, you know, work tirelessly to, um, you know, uh, really talk about your um, personal preferences and beliefs uh, and work together with, with our team and the whole breast cancer care team. Um, to uh, find what works best for you and to just provide the, the best care. Thank you for that, Dr. Myers. Dr. Sue, anything to add? I think Dr. Myers and I are both very, very happy to be here and be part of this and to be able to get the voice out about breast reconstruction awareness. And uh, we both thank everybody uh, for their time and contributing the videos, especially our patients who are willing to share their reconstructive journeys. Uh, with us and with our audience. Uh, it's a very personal thing, but I think it is very helpful for, for the, the folks out there to hear what, what somebody actually goes through when they undergo breast reconstruction. Thank you. I'd, I'd echo that. I thought those videos were very helpful indeed. Um, again, this presentation has been recorded. It will be available to view and share through the Michigan Medicine YouTube channel. We're also working on a follow-up blog post, which will be published on the Michigan Health blog next week. So if you follow the Michigan Medicine social media channels, you'll see uh, that blog will be posted up there. Uh, finally, we really want to thank you for spending time with us. Dr. Sue, Dr. Myers, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.